So is retinol over? Probably overstating it, but let's chat. This video is an overall guide about cosmetic retinoids mainly, but we'll touch on tretinoin and adapalene and some of the others as well. Most of us have probably already heard of retinol. It has sort of been the gold standard cosmetic retinoid for years. Even before like Skinstagram social media became popular, retinol was kind of like the one or the main ingredient brands were using. Over the last five to 10 years, I would say the category of retinoids has like grown exponentially. There are so many more options and so many more products on the market. It's now not just retinol, but a whole class of ingredients that together are known as retinoids. First, a little bit of an introduction. All of the different types of retinoids are essentially trying to emulate the effect of prescription vitamin A. They're trying to achieve that action, but generally in a more gentle, more sustained way, and in a way that isn't technically classified as a drug action. The goal of retinoids overall is to improve surface texture, to assist with the appearance of large pores, help with blemishes, and even as an acne treatment specifically, Although acne claims are more in the lane of like prescription or drug retinoids, cosmetic brands can't go down that conversation. And they're also known to help with pigmentation. And again, melasma is probably more prescription territory. And then of course, the anti-aging claims around like collagen lines and wrinkles and so on. So you'll notice that when we're talking about serious claims, that is very much where tretinol and adapalene come into it and cosmetic products kind of tackle everything a little bit more surface level. There's probably a little bit of argument or disagreement on how well cosmetic retinoids work versus prescription. And I'll touch on that later in the video a little bit because I think it's worth discussing. Put very simply, vitamin A hits all the bases. So that's why it's become such a significant ingredient in skincare. If you have a sunscreen and you have a retinoid, you've kind of ticked all of the boxes. Prescription vitamin A is recognized by the skin straight away, so it doesn't have to go through any conversion process in the skin. When you apply TRET, it's your, you're actually applying an active ingredient directly on the skin. Cosmetic options like retinol or retinal, they have to go through like an enzymatic oxidization process in the skin before they can actually start working. You've probably all heard of the general like pathway or sequence of events, but basically we start with retinol esters or esters in general that goes into retinol which then converts into retinal which then converts into the active form retinoic acid now something that i don't think is discussed as much you know in the skincare community overall is that how well this pathway happens is sometimes not just about the actual ingredient itself but how well a formula is developed and formulated but also how well a formulator is stabilized and I'm sure there's even a lot of other factors at play, just like your natural composition in your own skin and how that pathway actually occurs. So we see a lot of like even doctors discuss retinol, retinol, tretinoin in fairly simplistic terms and how retinol is automatically just a gentler precursor to tret. Before like retinol and retinol really became popular, a lot of brands were using retinol esters like retinol palmitate. This used to be considered like a gentler version of a retinol, but I think most brands have sort of moved away from using this and, and it has become more of a general antioxidant in skincare. There are also a bunch of like related derivatives like hydroxypenicolone retinoate or HPR, sometimes also known as gran active retinoid, and then more niche types like retinol retinoate. These derivatives have become quite popular, but, but they aren't really on the exact pathway that I discussed before. They're kind of like related cousins. The good thing about these derivatives is that they're generally known to be less sensitizing but something like retinol palmitate which is on the pathway just way far back is I'm not sure that anybody considers it to be that effective as far as actual retinoid results would go the other derivatives they're a little bit more like up in the air why do we even have retinoid options Tretinoin and retinoids overall are known to be quite like volatile molecules. They have a lot of stability issues, they're difficult to formulate with, and they're difficult to keep stable in a formula. And then there's the whole conversation around how aggressive they are on the skin. As consumers, we want results, but brands need shelf life. And of course, brands want consumers to see results, but with minimal irritation, because they want people to keep buying their pro products long term. Many, but not all, retinoids break down in the presence of light and air. So while a retinoid product might be fresh and active immediately when manufactured, there are questions around how long the product actually remains active and fresh by the time you receive it as a consumer. 
and then how much time you have to use it for maximum potency and potential. So basically, so basically maintaining freshness, a bit like food in a way, is a challenge for brands and just a challenge of retinoids overall. To combat this issue, brands have started to develop encapsulation. Well, not started, it's been around forever, but I think it's been embraced a lot more lately. And these encapsulation complexes essentially protect the ingredient like retinol or whatever it may be from accelerated degradation, but they also tend to allow for a slower release into the skin so they feel a little bit gentler from a consumer perspective. Encapsulation may also allow the retinoid to be delivered a little bit deeper into the skin, but I think that ends up being a little bit more formula dependent and also on the version of encapsulation that is being used. Having said that, not all brands use encapsulation. Some brands choose to stabilize the retinoid through packaging. And of course, some brands just sort of mix the product together and hope for the best, while other brands actually go through proper stability testing, proper efficacy testing. And that's the hard part to navigate because as a brand or as a consumer looking at brands, sometimes brands are often allowed to use supplier claims for the ingredient that they're using, which then relates to the product that's being released. But I think for retinoids, it's probably best to look for claims related directly to the product efficacy. And that can be hard to navigate because they can look quite similar when you're just reading it on surface value. And then other times brands are selling retinoid products just based on the reputation of retinol, where they haven't actually put any effort into doing anything to protect the product properly. And I think all of this is a reason why there are various price points. Not to say that there aren't good affordable retinoid products. I think a lot of the drugstore brands actually do more testing than most brands you'd probably even find in Sephora, but it is very much a case by case situation. And I would like suggest or urge you to spend a bit of extra time actually looking into the retinoid you're choosing to ensure that there's some level of like care that's been taken to create the product. As I mentioned earlier, another reason a variety of retinoids ex exist now is due to sensitivity. I mean like skin sensitivity. It is well known that retinoids can have side effects. These side effects include things like dryness, peeling, redness, just a general disrupted skin barrier. And generally speaking, the higher the strength, the higher the likelihood of irritation. The good thing about some of these derivatives is part of the reason they exist is to bypass a lot of these side effects. Now moving on to some specific suggestions. If you're a beginner or just if you know your skin is easily sensitized, and I think if you're like brand new to retinoids, that's really where like a derivative like the hydroxypinacolone retinoid comes into play as a good option. The risk of side effects from this is quite low. And it's usually an ingredient that most people find easy to tolerate and easy to integrate into a routine. One of the most well-known and well-priced options is the ordinary Grand Active Retinoid. I like the emulsion specifically. And the whole theory behind this derivative is that it's supposed to bypass the conversion process and actually act directly on the receptors in the skin. But a lot of this theory, I think, comes from supplier data. I don't know that there's much real-world information on this and how well... HBR actually works versus other retinoids like in a direct head-to-head -head battle and we don't have that much well-regarded information on what HPR best targets really even what like dosage is required for the best action on certain concerns so that's why I consider it more of a beginner retinoid there are just too many questions around it for me to use it long term as like a true retinoid product Again, unless your skin is maybe easily sensitized or this just happens to sit best in your budget, certainly not saying it's a bad product. It's just, yeah, I'm not sure that it should be considered at the like level, but I'm not sure it should be considered with the same standing as a typical retinoid. Another good option for beginners is to explore retinol in an encapsulated form. This tends to be offered in a fairly low dose. So again, the encapsulation protects the ingredient. It slows down the release, so it already feels gentler on the skin. And something like the Naturium Retinol Serum, I think is a great option. The texture is super lightweight and easy to layer. And again, that encapsulation just gives a lot of extra confidence that the product isn't breaking down too quickly. You'll also see around there are some even more novel derivatives. Uh, one of them is one of them is called like retinol sunflowerate or something like that. I think Glossier 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 is using that, and even and even like a hyaluronic based one called sodium retinol so sodium retinol hyaluronate. These are all just derivative options again for stability, but also to be more gentle on the skin. 
I tend to like the idea of retinoids, especially in the beginner category where they're using a combination. Something like the Iope Retinol Super Bounce Serum is a great one. This blends a few different versions of like retinoid derivatives all together. I guess the theory behind that is that having different versions of retinoids is kind of hitting the skin at different points or in different ways. So you're getting kind of these multifaceted benefits at different like processing times in the skin. And I think that just allows for a gentle product again with maybe a wider possibility of action. But if you don't really want to mess around with those versions of der derivatives, I think actually um, retinol is still a good option to start with. The Medicaid Crystal Series is very widely popular and they have a Crystal 3 that's a fairly low dose. So I think most people should be able to tolerate that pretty well. And there's also the option of using products that have short contact therapy in mind. So that's where you sort of apply it like a mask and rinse off. Cypher Skincare has a great retinoid mask with retinol specifically with this action or this usage in mind. For intermediate users or people that don't have easily sensitized skin, I think the options are even wider. And this is where I think retinol, N-A-L, has really become like the star or feature ingredient. Retinol has been around for several years, but it's only in the last year or two that it has really like blazed through with tons of options. To my knowledge, retinol as an ingredient is very unstable, so I believe it's always offered in some type of encapsulation system. In my experience using both retinol and retinol, because retinol is more likely to be encapsulated, it has always been just a more gentler user experience versus something that is just free retinol, it's my thinking. But because retinol tends to always be encapsulated, therefore it's gentler on the skin, it's therefore more stable in formula. It kind of just makes sense to me for retinol to be like the no-brainer decision for most people. And also it's closer in the retinoid pathway to being like the active form of retinoic acid in the skin. So again, it just has a lot of positives and really not that many negatives. In some ways I don't really understand why we would even have retinol still on the market. Although as I've mentioned, retinol is also available in, in encapsulated forms. And maybe it is cheaper to buy and produce, I'm actually not sure, but I feel like retinol prices have come down quite a lot over the last couple of years. So in my opinion, the need for retinol is not really there anymore. It is kind of over as an ingredient in that sense, but maybe I'm just jumping the gun a little bit. Now, having said that, to discuss a little bit of the flip side, the more like actual conservative approach is to still use retinol over retinol. I wouldn't say there's like an abundance of information out there about how the encapsulation systems actually work and whether they're releasing into the skin well enough to allow for this pathway to occur. You know, we've probably seen them around long enough now where there's also anecdotal evidence and I'm sure derms have enough of like a clinical impression where retinol has proven itself just fine. But I know that there are some truly conservative derms and even some scientists that still believe in retinol more so because the questions around encapsulation and how that's actually working maybe aren't as clear as they could be. And plus retinol just seems to have more actual historic efficacy data. So although I personally think retinol is the best option and I see no reason why you wouldn't do it, there is an argument as to why retinol is still around. I hope that I hope that makes sense. If you are interested in using retinol, I would say most people consider a percentage around 0.05 to be like a good intermediate level. This seems to be a good well-rounded amount, but with a fairly good tolerance threshold as well. Just keep in mind that you'll likely need several months before you start seeing results really for retinoids overall. If you are more conservative and you do prefer to stick with retinol, I think it's hard to go past SkinCeuticals as a brand. Their retinol formulas have been gold standard for a while and they just seem to be particularly high quality. And again, to mention Iope, they have really great retinol options and I love that they focus so much on packaging and stability. It's like exactly what you want to see from a brand offering a retinoid. I think generally it is a good rule of thumb to shop from brands that are talking about retinoid stability. There really is no point in buying like super cheap retinol serums, retinoid serums, if they're just going to lose potency and efficacy either before you've even opened them or very, or very quickly after you open them. There is the potential that some products that haven't been stabilized properly aren't even active by the time they get to you. 
I guess if you've ever bought a vitamin C serum and you've got it home and it's already oxidized, a very similar concept occurs with retinoids too. It's just that with vitamin C, we can see a color change, but you don't, you can't really visibly see that happening with a retinoid. So it's, so it's just much harder to tell if a retinoid has actually lost potency unless a brand is telling you how they've stabilized it. Although I mentioned 0.05% as a good intermediate strength for retinol, a lot of brands now have 0.1% formulations. 0.1% is what historically was known as like an advanced level, but I actually think most people can tolerate 0.1% with not a lot of issue, unless again, your skin leans a bit sensitive. It, within the last year or so, just even stronger versions have come out, implying that 0.1% was probably okay for the general population. So that's where we jump into retinoids for advanced users. Now, I think if you are in that advanced category, you're probably exploring prescription, but some people don't wanna go down the prescription road or don't have access, so they just want a slightly stronger cosmetic retinoid. Medicaid, as I said, is a leader in retinol and they offer a product called Crystal 20, which is a 0.2% retinol and that has become widely popular. The Ordinary also recently came out with a super affordable 0.2% emulsion and even more recently, an Australian brand called GoTo has launched very amazing retinol and that has 0.25% in it, which is like massive. And I actually really love that product. So if you're at all leaning more advanced in your like retinoid journey, the go-to one is very worth checking out. It's such a nice product. Just a note on these retinol formulations, especially in that 0.2% strength, be quite intense in color. So very yellow or very orange. And this could probably, will probably discolor your skin. So it's best to allow about 30 minutes or so when applying before going to bed because they probably will transfer to your pillow. So you just want to allow those products to absorb properly. The whole conversation around retinoid strength is, you know, a little bit difficult to convey with new nuance because it's not necessary to go directly to high strengths. A lot of people will benefit just from a more medium strength where consistency is just more important than the actual strength. But I think a lot of that will just come down to what your personal skincare concerns are and how resilient your skin is. You know, ultimately you want something to be relatively active and you want it at a point that you can use it regularly without um, causing barrier issues. I guess I would suggest if your skincare concerns are a little bit more chronic or you're sort of looking at lines and wrinkles and that kind of thing, then you might consider going a little bit higher in the retinoid strength. Back to the title of the video, is retinol over? I already discussed earlier on how there are a lot of just formula related benefits to retinol in the sense that it tends to automatically be stabilized in formula and that it tends to be gentler on the skin while also being closer in the retinoid pathway. And as I said before, to me personally, it's a no brainer to use retinol over retinol but even more of a no-brainer to use tretinoin or adapalene over retinol or retinol as well. Really as close as you can get to the active form is best, in my opinion anyway. And to stress, I don't necessarily mean best in terms of the actual ingredient itself. I mean best because the closer you get to the retinoid pathway, you're just generally relying less on the quality of formula because that ingredient is more likely to be more active in the skin sooner. But beyond just sort of personal preferences and formula discussion, is retinol over is actually a question or something that's kind of being enforced by the e by EU regulation. Historically, retinol has been available up to 1% pretty much worldwide. The EU have recently dropped that limit and face products down to 0.3%. So now this won't widely impact every product because they actually weren't that many brands offering retinol at like 0.5 or 1%. But advanced users that were looking for a high strength retinoid in the cosmetic realm, all of a sudden won't be able to find products that they used to use before. And that means several like cult favorite products like some SkinCeuticals or Paula's Choice, their 1% sort of flagship products won't be available in some markets. Another reason that retinol is probably being focused so much by brands and you've sort of, and we've seen just tons of launches lately. Also to discuss jars versus dropper bottles versus tubes. 
The conversation around packaging is often overstated on social media and it's something I don't think that should be driven from consumers generally. We just don't have enough information in terms of the stability requirements for a formulator and I think a brand is going to present their product in the most appropriate vehicle. Some brands will stabilize in formula, some brands will stabilize in packaging, some brands will do a bit of both but they all brands are making the right decision for their product and it's definitely not up to social media influencers or so-called experts to challenge why a brand has used a particular product. Something that I see often, especially from social media influencers, is this whole discussion around airless packaging. I actually think this comes from Paula's Choice because they're so big on dissing brands that don't use airless. But if you actually look into airless packaging, especially just those generic airless jars or even airless pumps, they hardly make a difference. So oxygen is still getting in. So yeah, that whole conversation is just pointless. A brand is going to use the packaging that works best for them. Having said that, there are some brands, and I mentioned like Oyopay as an example, they invest in more customized packaging where they're actually achieving higher levels of airless components, I guess. So I'm not talking about specialized packaging, it's just most brands are really using generic cosmetic packaging. So whether that's in a dropper or it's in a jar or whatever it is, the equivalent like oxygen exposure is very similar. I guess one tip I'd maybe suggest is maybe don't stock up on retinoids during sales. Although some products you'll see have a listed expiry or there'll, there'll be their little period after opening symbol, that usually refers to pack that usually refers to the stability of the formula in terms of safety. It's rarely about the actual efficacy or potency. So I guess think of retinoids like a Pepsi. You don't want to stock up on things that are prone to going flat too quickly. The other conversation is around percentages. Conversation around retinoid percentages in isolation without looking at the overall product is pretty pointless. So a retinoid percentage is never really more important than the overall story. Some things to keep in mind is that brands can be a little bit tricky with their marketing or phrasing. Some of them market a total concentration of ingredient complex rather than the active component of the retinoid itself. So when we're talking about things like encapsulation or complexes, they're a mixture of a bunch of different ingredients, not just the retinoid. For example, Sunday Riley touts a 6.5% blend, which is just a whole combination of retinoid ingredients. I guess their theory is that a lot of weaker retinoid or retinoid-like ingredients combined together has the equivalent of a high-strength retinoid by itself, but I'm not sure that you can actually correlate like a blend directly with how an ingredient is working when it's included at a high strength by itself. And even a brand like Beauty of Josen touts 2% liposomal retinol in their eye cream. But that 2% is the liposomal delivery system, which is a few other ingredients together. The actual amount of retinol is going to be just a fraction of that 2%. On the flip side, a brand like Iope that is focusing so, so much on stability, they've designed packaging to protect like a retinol molecule. When they say 0.3%, they're really trying to achieve that percentage over a long lifespan of the product. And that's why you might find that a 0.3% product feels stronger on the skin than even some 1% serums out there, all just related to the actual stability of the product. I think the conversation should always be less about the actual percentage and more so which brand or which product is maintaining the most efficacy over time. The general rule of thumb is that consistency and stability is more important than strength. And I'll also mention that while skin cycling can be useful, especially at the start of introducing a new product, usually being more consistent at a lower strength is still a better approach. Moving on to tretinoin and other prescriptions. Although I've spent a lot of time discussing cosmetic retinoids, I do think it's important to stress that they are cosmetics and they don't actually have clinical standing. That means that they aren't really considered to be treatment products or treatment ingredients. For this reason, I consider cosmetic retinoids to still be a great option in skincare and very worth considering for just general skin health and maintenance. But if you're actually trying to treat a medical condition, I fully believe medical conditions require medical ingredients. So think like actual acne or like chronic acne and melasma, those things actually require medical intervention. And I guess my other train of thought is because all these other ingredients are just trying to behave like TRET, 
why wouldn't you just use TRET if you can? You know, if you can tolerate it, if it's readily accessible. I hope I've sort of made clear in this video that when we talk about cosmetic retinoids, yes, there is a valid conversation around the ingredient itself, but we really need to stress the conversation about product quality, product innovation and product stability. When you're buying a drug like tretinoin, all those questions are answered. That ingredient is active, that product is working, no question. With a cosmetic, you don't ever really know. There aren't any like laws necessarily governing efficacy or potency. A drug product is really the only way to use a retinoid with absolute confidence. Now, all that said, I know there are limitations around TRET and just the overall risk of side effects is so much higher that a lot of people don't want to go through and that's totally understandable and that's where I think cosmetic retinoids really have become popular and why they are so popular. And there's of course and there's of course the train of thought that tretinoin being a more medical being a more medical ingredient maybe it has no place in general skincare anyway. So if your concerns are quite mild and you're just looking for general maintenance, there's probably no reason to look at TRET specifically. And the availability of TRET no one is challenging. You have to go through prescriptions. Some germs won't prescribe it unless you have actual signs of a medical condition. And in some countries, it's not really avail available at all. Plus the whole process of prescription going back for a repeat or whatever it is, I know it can be annoying. So I suspect that's why the online sort of dermatology services have become so popular. I have discussed limitations around compounded uh, retinoids in another video, so I'll link that below. So I guess to summarize that, I think medical conditions should be treated by medical ingredients like tretinoin or one of the other prescription retinoids. General skincare, general skin health, general skin maintenance, that's really what cosmetic retinoids are for. Now a note on adapalene specifically, in the United States and now in Australia, adapalene is considered an over-the-counter ingredient. This is another product type that has a guaranteed level of efficacy. It's still a drug or a therapeutic good, depending on the market. And I think especially if you have acne, chronic acne, any type of acne, adapalene is definitely the way to go. I would personally bypass all the other cosmetic retinoids and just go with adapalene. It's probably even cheaper than most of the products you're looking at. There is an adapalene derivative that's starting to pop up with different brands called adapanoid. I'm a bit confused by it because real adapalene tends to be quite well tolerated. So I literally see no point in using a derivative. A, deriv a derivative option might be good if you just don't have adapalene readily available to you. But again, if you're in the US, Australia, adapalene is out there. It's relatively affordable, probably cheaper than adapanoid. So again, I don't really get it unless you just can't get the original. I already spoke about other derivatives earlier in the video, but just to summarize, other derivatives tend to be around just to solve some of the side effect issues of retinoids and just the general stability. Some of them you can actually use in the daytime. So I know a popular one is, the, is retinol retinoate, which again is supposed to act on the skin straight away. It's just that this derivative tends to show up in fairly high-end products. So we're talking prices that are generally in the hundreds of dollars. So I get, that just confuses me a little bit because you can probably get TRET for much cheaper. So if you're buying it just for its gentleness, totally makes sense. But it's that cost versus benefit conversation where, again, a lot of these derivatives just don't have the same standing as a tretinoin or even a retinol. I've actually personally used a product from Verso called Blemish Fix. Um, I think they've maybe renamed the product. This uses retinol retinoe and I absolutely loved it. It definitely helped maintain clarity in my skin but it's also combined with other ingredients. So it's hard to know exactly what's having an effect. In some ways I would maybe even consider this like a bonus or an extra on top of other retinoids. So if you're maybe using retinol in the evening, you could also add retinol retinoate during the day, just as a, as like a double prong <laughs> attack in your skin. But it just, but then I just come back to the fact that, you know, if you do have chronic skincare concerns and you feel like you need to use retinoids that much, then you might as well aim for tretinoin instead. I enjoy using novel skincare ingredients like all the time. I love peptides, for example, but I guess I treat sunscreen and a retinoid fairly seriously and I just want to know those two things are working. That way I can be a little bit loose and casual in my routine with everything else. This turned out to be a super long video, so I probably lost you like 30 minutes ago. But to summarize everything just quickly once again, so the retinol pathway goes esters, then retinol, retinol, 
and that all is aiming to convert into retinoic acid, which is tretinoin. And adapalene is kind of there, but related to tretinoin, just slightly different. And I think the closer you can get to tretinoin without irritating your skin too much while using the product consistently is really the aim of this whole conversation. And it is probably becoming clear that retinol is becoming the star like cosmetic ingredient just because of its inherent stability due to encapsulation, but also it seems to be gentler on the skin and just easier for most people to tolerate. Retinoids are very far reaching and quite a complicated topic. I tried to discuss the nuance as much as I can, but I'm sure I've missed some details here and there. And I don't think there is necessarily a best approach for everyone. It's really just whatever you can use comfortably, whatever is the most affordable with the best stability, that's going to give you the best result. And I would say that retinoids are a long-term journey, so there's really no point in using them as a spot treatment or using them for a month or two. If you're deciding to go down the road of a retinoid, we're really talking like minimum months, but likely years and years, if not forever if not forevermore. <laughs> Everything I've said in this video is basically just a formation of my own opinions and interpretations, and also the experience of using products. I started with esters, then moved to retinol, then retinol, then into tretinoin, so I've kind of been through the journey. I do have tons of creators that I love to follow that help me unpack and under understand these topics. Some of these creators are Lab Muffin, of course, The Eco Well, Annalisa from Skin Perspective, Dr. Samantha Ellis, Dr. Mark Strong, Dr. Dre, and Dr. Ranella Hirsch, who used to be much more active on Instagram, but hasn't really been around lately, unfortunately. I also have a whole other video discussing retinization and how to get through side effects, especially on the stronger retinoids like tretinoin. So I'll link that video below. And I also have another video Video discussing different types of tretinoin because I think they can make a difference with user experience. So I'll link that video down below as well. Otherwise, let me know if you have your own opinions or if you have any questions that I can maybe answer for you. I'll do my best to get back to you in the comments. So yeah, and don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Sam by the Counter, and I will see you in the next video.